Hello, I'm Hugh Ross. I'm the founder of Reasons to Believe and an astrophysicist. I also serve in the pastoral staff between a, a church between Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, bringing you a, a breakthrough discovery. Literally, this just got published a few hours ago, an advance in a publication in the journal Nature Astronomy. The title of the paper, A Possible Direct Exposure of the Earth to Cold, Dense, Interstellar Medium 2 to 3 Million Years Ago. Consequently, as a special edition of Stars, Cells, and God, I'm bringing you this uh, breaking uh, discovery. And it pertains to how this interstellar molecular cloud explains uh, how we got into an ice age cycle. And let me begin by pointing out what I did in this book, Weathering Climate Change, how we need to be in a fi highly fine-tuned ice age cycle in order to have global advanced civilization. Uh, so this uh, slide here basically gives you a couple of the advantages uh, that we get uh, from uh, an ice age cycle. Namely that uh, with an ice age, you get a huge accumulation of ice. Ice and snow is a property that melts slowly. So when you're in, when you're in between ice ages like we are now, the melting of ice left over from the last ice age provides water to irrigate the great agricultural plains a huge factor in explaining how we can feed billions of human beings and all of our domesticated animals. And also with an ice age cycle, we see that the ice rapidly melts uh, when you're going from an ice age to an interglacial, and that rapid melting of ice ignites volcanic eruptions around the world, and the dust from those volcanic eruptions, the dust and ash, fertilizes the great uh, agricultural plains you get another effect, and that is you get winds blowing off the high plateaus of the earth and dumping nutrient-rich dust onto the great agricultural plains. And so we got this uh, uh, cycle uh, that regularly brings water and nutrients to the great agricultural plains. And uh, the, the following slide basically shows you the incredible scenery we get from being in an ice age cycle. The rapid retreat of ice carves out fjords and canyons around the world. We get these beautiful waterfalls. And so uh, we have this wonderful scenery. It also enhances the ecosystems of the world. In this book, Weathering Climate Change, I list over a dozen different benefits we get from living in an ice age cycle. The problem though is how do we have ice today when the sun is brighter than it's ever been in the history of the Earth. So the following slide basically shows you the brightening of the sun over the history of life on planet Earth. And what you notice is that the sun today is about 23% brighter than that moment 3.8 billion years ago when God created the first life on planet Earth. And life can only tolerate about a 1% change. Uh, but we have God introducing different life at different times, as it tells us in Psalm 104, uh, pulling greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. So as the sun gets brighter and brighter and brighter, the greenhouse gases become less and less abundant in Earth's atmosphere, keeping the temperature of the surface of the Earth ideal for life. Uh, but the challenge is that for 90% of the history of life on planet Earth, our planet's been ice-free. So how do we explain the fact that when the sun is brighter than it's ever been before, today we have ice. We've had ice for the past 2.58 uh, uh, million years. Well, as I mentioned in weathering climate change, what initiated the ice age cycle was the Altanen impactor. And the next slide basically shows you the location of where this big asteroid hit the, uh, the uh, South uh, Pacific uh, uh, Ocean, uh, basically to the left of the tip, southern tip of South America, uh, hit in 17,000 foot depth of water. And this caused aerosols to go into the Earth's atmosphere. And so for many years, there was this dramatic cooling effect. And this cooling effect resulted in the accumulation of ice over Antarctica, over the uh, uh, North Pole, uh, over the Tibetan Plateau. And so that began the Ice Age cycle. Uh, that collider hitting in the ocean uh, started this cooling effect. But a mystery that never got resolved, even when I was writing this book, was how do you sustain the cooling? And that's where this paper comes in. It basically addresses the question, how to sustain the cooling 
ignited by the Altanen impactor because an asteroid impacting in the water would generate very significant cooling, but it wouldn't last that long. Uh, we're talking maybe a few decades, and so how do you sustain the cooling thereafter? And so what these researchers did is basically come up with evidence that what happened at about the same time as the Zeltan and impact, or maybe slightly thereafter, was that the solar system entered into cold, dense uh, interstellar clouds. Now, our solar system resides in what we call the local bubble, but within that local bubble, uh, there are these small, uh, dense uh, interstellar clouds. And uh, the density is about a thousand times greater than the rest of what we see in the bubble. And these authors point out the fact that we're looking at an incredibly rare event uh, because these uh, cold, dense clouds fill up only a tenth of a percent of the space in the local bubble in which the solar system resides, local bubble being an under-dense region of our galaxy. And then under-density actually is a crucial factor for explaining why advanced life currently is possible on the Earth. Uh, but within that local bubble, one-tenth of a percent of the volume is filled with these cold, dense interstellar clouds. And what they're pointing out is that through a study of uh, 21 centimeter radiation, the 21 centimeter radio line, spectral line, is the line of uh, neutral hydrogen. And uh, it's the strongest spectral line we see in radio astronomy. It basically maps the distribution of hydrogen. And so these astronomers uh, took advantage of a survey. Uh, I think the name of the survey, yes, I got it written down here somewhere, uh, the H1 uh, survey, H1P1 survey. And uh, it was that survey that they analyzed and basically was able to demonstrate uh, that it revealed we entered into a hydrogen-dense region, namely the signature of one of these interstellar molecular clouds, uh, roughly about two to two and a half uh, million years ago. And then they were able to affirm this uh, through two radioisotopes, uh, iron uh, 60, which has a radiometric decay rate of about two and a half million years. That's the half-life of iron 60. Then they also looked at plutonium 244. And plutonium 244 and iron 60, these are radioisotopes that are produced by supernova eruptions. And so they were able to look at uh, you know, deep uh, sediment cores in the ocean, uh, look at ice cores in Antarctica, and actually looked at lunar rocks to demonstrate that at about the same time, two to two and a half million years ago, we see this overabundance of uh, plutonium-244 and iron-60, basically affirming that indeed uh, the uh, heliosphere uh, was collapsed by our entry uh, into one of these dense, cold interstellar molecular clouds. The heliosphere basically refers to uh, the region outside of the sun where the outgoing solar radiation balances the incoming cosmic radiation. Today, the uh, diameter of that um, heliosphere is about 130 times uh, the distance that Earth is from the sun. And they were able to demonstrate uh, through this study of the hydrogen survey and the radioisotopes uh, that when the sun entered this interstellar molecular cloud, that heliosphere got pushed back from 130 times Earth's distance to the sun to one quarter Earth's distance, which meant that Earth was now outside the heliosphere uh, when the solar system entered that cold, dense molecular cloud. And so uh, uh, the heliosphere shrunk which means we got exposed to more cosmic radiation. That would explain the extra plutonium-244 and iron-60. And uh, there'd be three effects of us going through this cold, dense interstellar molecular cloud. 
Uh, the first being we'd be exposed to more hydrogen because uh, that's what you see in, in, uh, in one of these cold, dense molecular clouds is the density of hydrogen is a thousand times greater than it would be if you're not in one of those clouds. So we get exposed to more hydrogen and more hydrogen in the upper atmosphere of the Earth is a cooling effect on the Earth. So I would explain some of the cooling that takes place. Also being outside of the heliosphere, uh, the ozone uh, shield would be uh, significantly collapsed. That would also have a cooling effect. And then, of course, we get exposed to more interstellar dust. Because in an interstellar, uh, cold, dense interstellar cloud, there's a lot of dust. And that dust would block out some of the light of the sun. And so there's three cooling effects that work together when we enter into that. Now, we're not in that cloud today uh, because what we see is that the heliosphere extends out to 130 times uh, Earth's distance from the sun. So we exited uh, that interstellar cloud. Uh, but there's studies of the plutonium-244 and the iron-60 tells us that we probably exited uh, that cold, dense uh, cloud about one and a half uh, to one and three quarter million years ago. But that basically tells us for a million to a million and a half years, we had this very significant cooling effect. So the Altanen Collider initiated the Ice Age cycle and this entry into this dense, cold interstellar cloud sustained it for another million to a million and a half years. And that explains a mystery that never really got resolved uh, when I was going through the literature for weathering climate change. How do we sustain the cooling effect so that we get an ice age cycle literally lasting for the past 2.58 million years? The discovery that they were announced here basically makes this point. As they end the paper, they say, look, we just got started on this. There's a lot of research that can be done to affirm what we discovered, uh, to actually come up with better dates and actually better measurements as exactly what the cooling effect would be. But this is a major breakthrough explaining how indeed uh, we entered into an ice age cycle 2.58 million years ago, and it got sustained long enough that we're still in an ice age cycle today, a crucial feature that enables us to have advanced high technology civilization uh, all over the world. And then there's just a paragraph in this paper that says, right now, we're not in a dense interstellar uh, cloud, but we're in a very diffuse one, and uh, we're rapidly going through it, and how we're going to be exiting that cloud within the next few thousand years. Now, it's not cold and dense like these other clouds that basically sustain the uh, Ice Age cycle, but as we exit uh, the small, uh, rather diffuse interstellar cloud in right now, uh, that should result uh, in a slight warming of the Earth. So it's another factor to consider in terms of the uh, global warming debate and climate change debate. Within a few thousand years, we're going to be exiting the local interstellar cloud, and that will have an effect on our climate. And, uh, you know, so much has been discovered uh, since I brought this book out a couple of years ago. I'm now seriously considering coming up with a second book because today we got a much stronger case for the conclusions I made here. And yes, this discovery will be part of it. It's actually showing us that it takes a lot more fine tuning than we recognized even two years ago in order for humanity at this brief window in time in the history of a solar system can have global uh, high technology civilization where it's possible for billions of human beings uh, to live on the planet at one time with a technology that all of us can hear the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. I think God planned all of this billions of years ago, even before he created the universe. As we see in the Bible, God begins his works of redemption before he creates anything at all. And as we look at the record of nature, we see evidence for God's work of redemption literally beginning before he created anything. And this paper just gives us even more evidence for that. And we'll keep you up to date. Anytime there's a major breakthrough scientific discovery, uh, we will be posting it on our YouTube channel as part of our Star Cells and God feature. And if you've got questions or comments, uh, please make them. Uh, I'll endeavor to respond to as many of them as I'm able to do. Thank you.